Hello everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, deploying uh, GIS applications on cloud native stacks, um, in this case Kubernetes. So uh, just to begin with, who am I? Uh, I was introduced as a sysadmin. I've kind of moved into this DevOps role. Um, I have no formal GIS training. I sort of got asked to do this project and had no idea what a coordinate system was. Uh, I had my first experience, well, changing from one coordinate system to another about three weeks ago. So uh, yeah, that's, that's about the level of knowledge. Um, so just a small bit of history about how we normally build our, our technological stacks. Um, we tend to have these quote unquote pet VMs where uh, there's a lot of manual process put into building them. Um, people end up becoming owners of them. So when something goes wrong with uh, a particular server, someone else will say get XYZ person and it's their problem. Um, even though realistically we should have everybody know how to work with most of our systems. Um, we are slowly moving towards DevOps and Cloud Native. The problem there is with any large company, we're approximately 350 employees. Um, there's a lot of legacy systems to consider um, and a lot of people who are very hesitant uh, for change because people don't, uh, don't like what they don't know. Um, we're also normally deploying things with more traditional tools, so Puppet, Ansible, uh, for system configuration. And we tend to have the traditional ops are in one team and developers in another. And operations say things about, you know, developers want to throw something over the wall that they shouldn't, or developers complain that operations are being a little too strict on what they're trying to do. Um, so just to compare some more traditional approaches that you will see, uh, there's the all-in-one virtual machine. I think someone spoke about those last night um, in the lightning talks. Uh, the problems with those is you tend to just install things on there. There's not usually a lot of configuration management. They're difficult to scale up to multiple machines because you might be running four or five applications on a single machine. Um, the alternative to that is the handcrafted pet VMs I just uh, mentioned. Uh, when we create one of those, there's still a lot of manual configuration to install a piece of configuration software such as Ansible or Puppet. Um, we still have to think about how many resources we're going to allocate, and that's a very static value. Um, it's very difficult to change. Um, like I said, we treat them like pets. They have owners. Um, people tend to be very scared to work on a system that someone else built. Um, and while they don't have the scaling issue, it's still a time consuming task to stand up a new VM, set it up, set up your configuration management and so forth. Um, so with these approaches, nothing is wrong. Um, for most companies, the, these tend to work, uh, most organizations. Um, as I mentioned, they, they lack flexibility um, and, oh God, something's happened to the, the font. Um, <laughs> sorry, about 20 minutes before this, uh, this presentation, I had to convert this from a web-based presentation to a PDF file. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I clearly didn't read the email properly. Uh, anyway, uh, the configuration tends to tightly be coupled to that project, meaning that any uh, gains with doing that, uh, trying to have a generalized approach, don't always work. Um, and we also tend to have a lot of deviation between environments. So um, the machine built on a developer's laptop may be an all-in-one vagrant you know linux virtual machine box whereas the development stack or the production stack sorry is probably seven or eight different boxes each with their own role in a singular application um, um yeah 
Um, and obviously, who's heard the phrase, it worked on my machine. <laughs> uh, we've been thinking about getting a swear jar for that one. Um, so into cloud native. Um, these aren't everything that defines cloud native. Um, these are just a handful that have been picked from the Cloud Native Computing Foundations list. Um, if you're not aware of who the Cloud Native Computing Foundation are, they're a subset of the Linux Foundation that has been brought together to handle projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, which is a Kubernetes uh, native monitoring solution. Um, but anyway, yeah, they're containerized, so as in Docker, which I imagine by now most people are aware of. Um, orchestration means you don't worry about where your application lives. Uh, you let the software, in this case, it'll be Kubernetes, handle where your application lives in your infrastructure. You just worry about the application is in there. Um, and uh, I put brackets around micro because it's more service oriented. You don't look at an application as the whole, the whole thing is your application as opposed to uh, uh, the application is comprised of services, sorry. Um, and flexible in that you can dynamically scale both your infrastructure and your services. So. Uh, if you need more compute power, it's really simple, one-liner. I can add three servers of compute power. Um, it's highly available, so if one machine goes down, the whole thing doesn't die. Uh, and things like disaster recovery. Um, it makes better use of resources, because we pull the resources, and like I said, the dynamic orchestration will allocate your containers or your applications, where they can go, where there's resources available. And portability in that this configuration can be, or well, flexible as in portability in that your configuration can be quite easily moved between cloud providers, um, meaning you aren't necessarily locked into a certain vendor if you want to have uh, your application on one cloud and then you want to have your disaster recovery on another one. Um, it's entirely possible. Um, so looking at Kubernetes, um, it's one example of how to do cloud native. It's right now probably the most popular. There's a few others such as Docker Swarm, but this one seems to be the one that's taken over. Um, uh, yeah, the configuration is all simple YAML syntax. Um, I don't know how many people have sort of opened up something like Puppet, looked at the, the horrifically difficult at times syntax and gone, I don't want to do that. Give me back you know, my manually built bash scripts. Um, reverting a bad configuration is quite simple because of this. Um, and uh, I've already explained that. So basically how Kubernetes works is we have uh, two, and this, this paradigm is pretty common amongst cloud native technologies. Uh, we have master, manager, leader. So on nodes, these, each of these boxes represents just a virtual machine. Um, and then we have minions, which basically carry out whatever the master nodes say to do. So the master nodes schedule containers, create and maintain your resources. They ensure that everything is healthy your minion worker follower nodes literally just run your application. You don't have to worry about them doing anything. They are just about bringing in compute resource. Um, so how does this help us? Uh, less overheads. I think in the last talk, it was a lot about how cloud helps us with that. Um, less overheads and cost. Um, wasted compute time is very expensive. If I have to stand up eight servers when I really only need three, um, that costs a lot of money. Um, time, uh, like I said, Puppet is significantly more fiddly than containers and YAML syntax. And portability, um, as I mentioned, uh, when we initially built this, we built this on a local Kubernetes cluster. We dropped it into the cloud and it worked seamlessly. 
Um, and the, the other overhead is uh, you don't have to fight your IT team because they set up your cluster and you deploy your application to it. Um, what else we got? Uh, oh yeah, and it gives you more time to make maps, <laughs> which I imagine for this crowd will be uh, quite important. Um, so in our experience, there is quite a steep learning curve initially. Um, you have to learn a lot of jargon, a lot of verbs, a lot of nouns, things. Um, I didn't know the difference between a daemon set and a deployment when we started, and I still fully don't. Um, <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of nuance to a lot of these things, um, and it is well documented, but there's also quite a steep learning curve initially. Um, it becomes very easy to make changes once something new is learnt, though. So once you've got a handle on the basics, uh, if you turn around and decide, oh, I don't like the way we did that, it's not a particularly difficult or time-consuming job to go through and adjust it to the new thing you've learnt, um, as opposed to where state actually matters on your virtual machines in the past. It's quite difficult to go in, revert, a, revert your state, or modify it, and so forth. Um, and yeah, uh, some applications aren't architected for the cloud. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It just makes things uh, a little bit more difficult to configure, which we'll go through a bit later on. Um, well, here, apparently. <laughs> um, so uh, the first thing we decided to do, which uh, half the internet will tell you you shouldn't, um, is running a database in Kubernetes. Now, this actually isn't, there's a lot of fear mongering around this because people are scared. Um, scared that they'll lose their data, scared they'll lose their database. Uh, on the other hand, um, we, we tried a couple of things. We settled on, uh, there's a project called KubeDB by a company called AppsCode. Um, they make it very simple to set up a master replica Postgres database. Um, they basically take care of all the heavy lifting for you. It's an open source project. You can inspect the source code. You can see what's actually being run in your cluster. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, KubeDB, when we first started using it, it uses a Linux distribution called Alpine that is very small, but didn't have support for a lot of GIS type tools, uh, particularly, I think it was GDAL we had a lot of trouble with. Um, so, <laughs> well, we, we tried a lot of things compiling it manually and didn't really get anywhere. So we ended up going with a Debian base image instead. <laughs> if it works, it works, right? Um, and yeah, it, we also had a few challenges around safely exposing the database for external use. Um, we eventually settled on using an external proxy virtual machine. It's not ideal, but it works. Um, it's not quote unquote cloud native, but uh, sometimes security is a little more important than ease of use. Um, so the next challenge we faced was trying to create a scalable geo server cluster. Um, we, the geo server configuration is entirely stored on disk as files, which poses an interesting challenge because getting files into your system that aren't in the form of uh, say, a database um, can be a somewhat challenging uh, system to do. And also maintaining those things. You have to actually spin up block storage or object storage, connect those things, maintain them. Um, the, this, this posed another challenge in that if you want to scale GeoServer out, every version of GeoServer you're running has to have its own, or has to have access to the same copy of configuration. Um, so, yeah, we, we basically came to the conclusion it needed to have the same configuration and data. Um, we had to know when a file on disk has changed and the PDF thing has broken my presentation again. Um, our simple solution was we wrote a small microservice that piggybacks off of the geo server notification module. It goes out, queries Kubernetes API and says, how many endpoints do you have that are geo servers? and then reloads all of those in turn. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we, we ended up using a shared file system. We initially tried using a object storage based solution, but found that for certain files and certain parts of the configuration, they were just a little too slow. Um, and this is probably the, oh, yeah. Um, this is the last sort of challenge we faced. Uh, well, last large challenge we faced. Um, by default, GeoServer ships with a built-in GeoWeb cache. Um, for our needs that really didn't suit it, we wanted to have a tile cache be a separate service from a WMS server, from um, a Postgres database. So we ended up uh, using the standalone, pulling the, all of the, the GeoWeb cache components out of GeoServer and uh, redirecting all of the tile requests or every WMS request through GeoWeb cache initially, um, which sounds a little insane, but uh, we solved this by adding a pretty simple proxy in front of GeoWeb cache and GeoServer that just says, does GeoWeb cache actually have that tile? If not, go to GeoServer, get it, return it, um, which is fairly straightforward. And uh, in this, we've learned that uh, these free and open source GIS projects are very mature pieces of software. They're very reliable. Um, some already have integrations. Uh, and long term, that's something we'd like to change. We would like to uh, have these applications less reliant on just S3 and more cloud native. Um, yet yeah, containers and cloud native software take care of a lot of the, the boring things, the day-to-day -day management that you don't need to worry about. Um, we haven't had any major incidents that I'm aware of where the whole thing has fallen over, um, short of problems with our cloud provider. And uh, yeah, the other thing is this is a huge eco space. Um, there's, you know, Docker and Kubernetes are a very, very small part of a very large ecosystem. Um, and some of these move very slowly at times because people lose interest or, um, you know, um, we've had a little bit of trouble with that. And uh, if you're interested in knowing any more or contacting me about this, that's my email address there. And uh, yeah, questions. That's a really good presentation. Um, GeoWeb Cache is able to have a shared cache directory. Yes. Did you try that? If yeah, you... so we're, we're caching. Oh. We're caching directly to object storage. Um, at this stage, it was more about if we wanted more tile caches available for, say, rendering a bunch of tiles in advance, or um, it's also more about making things as atomic as possible. So one of the big principles of containerization is each application should try to do one thing. Um, and we just wanted GeoServer to be our WMS server. We wanted a tile cache. They work together. Fair enough. Yeah. Cool. Questions from the audience? Dave? So I'm terrified of running a database in Kubernetes. Could you go into a little more uh, around the decision to use to do that rather than, say, RDS? So um, first of all, it, it, it terrified me myself to begin with. Uh, I had many a conversation with one of my colleagues about should we really be doing this? Um, in particular, there are quite a few quite good projects out there. Uh, KubeDB is one. There's another one for Postgres called, I think, I think the company name is Crunchy Data. Um, these, these providers uh, do a lot of things around that, so automated object storage backups. Uh, you can also automatically rebuild from a snapshot. Um, for our use case, uh, it, it definitely works. I can see there be use cases where potentially having some other type of database service would be much better. But I think as long as you're always backed by physical storage, solid backups, and a solid backup plan, you shouldn't be scared. It's not really that far different from just running a Postgres container with a block storage thing behind it. Or Did you have access to a DB as a service? In that your is also true. So we're using Catalyst Cloud, and we don't yet have database as a service. Um, 
So yeah, that did. So you couldn't in. even if you wanted. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, is Catalyst IT going to be building a database as a service? I believe so. Ooh. I'm not. Stay tuned. Not certain folks. on when. I, I don't want to make any promises for. For, for Kubernetes Docker backed one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Any other questions? Really, just a comment. A lot of what you said. Um, yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I wanted to make this as easy. I didn't want to get too bogged down in nitty gritty details because that scares people. The pain points that you said are real. Yeah. Cool. So, Chris. Thanks. So, um, do you get a comment on, I don't mean cost financially, but yep. the cost of doing effectively making things cloud native? I mean, how hard? There's there a lot is of work involved in that, right? And you've got to make a, work a business involved, decision about whether to do that or not, because there's a lot of work, right? Personally, that, that's not a business decision I make. I mean, I'm just the, the developer. Um, we do have a team lead. That isn't technically me. Um, there is an overhead, uh, especially considering we're very, very new to this space. We've done bits and pieces of GIS before, but nothing like this. Um, we're also well, sorry, very new to the cloud native space. Um, our cloud is just getting started with their, their Kubernetes as a service offering, which, which is what we're using for this. Um, yeah, there, there's overhead in building, like I said, those extra microservices, having to test uh, multiple competing solutions, things like that. Um, The splitting geo server one with the notifications was, uh, you'd count that in an hour, in hours, like a couple of hours of, of dev time. The uh, geo web caching proxying part, that was probably the better part of a week of our time. We're, we're quite a small team, there's only three of us. So um, yeah, that took quite a bit of our time just to get right, make it reliable, stable. That sort of thing. So yeah, there is there is a, a time component. It does get shifted around. Cool. All right, we got to call it there. Thank you very much again, cool. Alistair. Cheers.